today we're going to talk about projective identification. It's a term that often isn't understood, even though it's something that we all experience every day in our lives. And so I'd like to break it down for you and begin to tell you how it compares to just what we heard of as normal projection for the usual psychological term that people are familiar with, how it's different and how it relates to both our everyday lives and, of course, to the clinical situation for those who are both in psychotherapy as patients and those who are practicing psychotherapy and as psychoanalysts and psychotherapists. Um, so, first of all, the term projection is something you may be familiar with where if somebody doesn't like something about themselves, for example, they feel inadequate, they might call somebody else, they might think they see that in somebody else. If they feel, um, you know, if they feel that they're not smart enough, they might call somebody else an idiot. If they think they're not pretty enough, they, or, or they feel that or they feel their own hostility but want to deny it, they might call somebody else a bitch or a bastard. This is the ways that we, in our mind, we might do this. Just in our mind, think of other people in, uh, through these projected images of things that relate to parts of ourselves we don't want to own. But it's one thing when it just goes on in our own minds, and it's another thing when it gets played out between two people uh, who are in the same room together and also through a whole mind-body connection that goes on as we're in the same room together. Uh, in projective identification as opposed to projection, it is always about something you actually, um, that happens with two people in close proximity. So of course it happens in the clinical situation with a psychotherapist and, and their patient. And, but it also happens every day, and certainly it happens in marriages all the time between people and whoever's together. So in projective identification as opposed to projection, we don't just think in our mind of the other person having something that we don't desire in ourselves, so we want to get rid of that and say it's in the other person. But we actually deflect something that we're experiencing into another person. Now this can happen mentally and physically, um, but it always is somebody is not wanting to feel something inside themselves, but they're not aware of that, they're not talking about that. If they were talking about it, they might not have to just push it into somebody else viscerally or mentally, but when it's when they're not talking about it, that they just want to get rid of it and it's put into the other and the other has a reaction to it. So for example, um, I as a psychotherapist, on the one hand, I can feel something if somebody's suppressing feelings of needing to cry or scream, I can, and I start coughing or feeling like coughing, I could sense, oh, there's something being suppressed in this woman or man sitting with me that I feel like coughing up because it's being deflected into me. That can make me aware to say to them, I think you're suppressing your feelings. So let's, and then with one woman I did this where she just then started to cry and all these feelings came up because I was able to sense that I was having a reaction to what she was suppressing and it was being deflected into me and I was feeling it viscerally as needing to cough. Um, then there are even more complex reactions like that that can happen on a visceral level um, where one day I felt that there was this pain in my t intestine as a woman spoke to me who's been in weekly psychotherapy and she was talking about a bulimic friend of hers who was throwing up and what we know about bulimia is it's related to this profound primal ambivalence about swallowing or spitting up 
a toxic other or mother originally and that and you want to get rid of this person who's inside of you that you haven't been able to digest from your childhood so you oh, but you need them so you want to swallow them but then again you experience the trauma or the toxicity of what you experienced with them in your childhood it all goes on unconsciously and then you throw up but with this woman she had re in herself she had this even more recessed or more repressed in her than her bulimic friend who could actually throw up she also would think of talk of being nauseous whenever she thought of her mother who was to her a very toxic figure totally intrusive abusive in her childhood uh, coming inside of her in all kinds of overbearing and attacking ways and always too overpowering and and so she felt nauseous at just the very thought of her mother so here she was talking about her bulimic friend and she unconsciously was experiencing this dynamic of the toxic mother other that she wanted to throw up but she had repressed it so much that it wasn't she wasn't throwing up in a literal bulimic way and she wasn't even throwing up at the moment her feelings of her mother verbally she was just telling me about this other person and I yet I found this pain in my intestine sensing that her bulimic conflict was more deeply recessed inside of her but I also knew that in my feeling it that way it related to her relationship with me and how in her unconscious I was also had to become like her mother in order for her to be in the room with me anyone she was with would become the mother who couldn't be digested so I started to relate what was going on in me viscerally feeling this pain as I listened to her talk I started relating it to what was actually going on with her and me and how she was feeling when she talked about someone else in her life at that moment being like a predator who was who was coming after some guy before his wife died coming after and doing it in her presence and making her feel the toxic poisonous reaction of this woman who was such a predator I said well do you experience me in any way as being like a predator being too much for you so then she said well I do feel in a milder way I do feel a little pressured by you for the fact that I thought I was going to have a break this week and not have to have my session and it was a, a, a time right between Christmas and New Year's but I hadn't gone away and so I was there and she was obligated to come for her session in addition I had come in in a snowstorm and so she didn't get out of her session that way either because I, she had to um, she had to change the session to a different time when she could come in because I was there for her session so when she did come she came late and she said that her watch must have stopped because she didn't realize it was 15 minutes late so I said to her oh it seems like your watch is helping you escape the session it was obviously to me she wanted to distance from me at that point and then she started talking about well I did feel somewhat pressured I didn't I wanted a break I didn't want to have to come this week so she was able to talk about that but I realized that at a much deeper level this pain in my intestine was talking about the conflict about needing me but also wanting to get rid of me and me being too much by having this demand that she be there I mean just the demand of the set normal session schedule um, in her unconscious became <coughs> a huge overbearing maternal demand that she do everything at my be at my beck and call and do everything on my terms so the pain of her wanting to get rid of me and yet needing me because she didn't know who she needed the therapy although at that moment she just wanted a break from it and she talked about cutting loose when she felt like that she also had acknowledged she couldn't just cut loose from therapy because she really needed it she also needed this other back doctor who to help her with her back problems and there was a weekly session for that and so she felt like I want to 
get out of both of these and cut loose, but I need them. So what a dilemma. She was always feeling, you know, damned if she did, damned if she don't. She can't just cut loose because then she wouldn't get what she needed by getting our help, but at the same time, she didn't want to believe she needed my help or this other doctor's help because she wanted to be free to do whatever she wanted whenever she wanted to do it. She didn't want to have to have the obligated to any schedule, even if she was the one who came to me for therapy and voluntarily decided to set up a schedule to get a therapeutic process going. So she was not aware at this deeper level of this oral conflict of wanting to get rid of me and yet kind of swallowing me to get what she could get out of me, but then wanting to get rid of me, wanting a break from me. And this pain was there, and she deflected it into me, and I felt it in my intestine. I didn't say at the moment that I was feeling it, but I was understand. I was asking her if she felt pressured by me, because I could feel she was had this pressure she was putting into me. And she did say she felt like she wished she could have had a break. So we were talking about it on a very adult level of, you know, she wished she could have had a break from the therapy relationship. But on this other level was the infant and child in her that wanted a break from having to have her one and only mother be someone who was toxic and overbearing and attacking and, and abusive. And she, a mother who killed her, her pet chickens and then dragged her across the street and said, if you tell anyone that I killed the chickens, I'll kill you too. So that was a pretty overwhelming, threatening mother. A mother who went took along with her father, dragged her, um, abducted her to an operation she needed for to her tonsils. They didn't tell her they were going to take her to the doctors. They told her she was getting dressed up to go to her grandmother's house in a pretty dress. And the next thing she knows, she's down on some bed where her parents are holding her down on each side. They're putting a mask over her head, and they're... And she's so terrified they're putting, they're, they're killing her. They're, this is just going to kill her, this gas they're putting into her, and they keep forcing her down. So this is the kind of overbearing, suffocating reaction she got from her parents. All of that pressure was now in her, her intestine, putting it into me to try to get rid of it. So every day we experience things where there's so many people in the world and people in, in us all that when we want to get rid of things, we could unconsciously deflect them into some other person who happens to be in the room. And so even though people seem independent, they can actually be having this aversive effect on each other. Sometimes we can even put good things into other people too. It's not always aversive things that we want to get rid of. Sometimes we even put loving parts of ourselves into the other because we think that the other is more ideal to be loved than we are. And in not valuing ourselves, we think, well, they're the ones who deserve the love, not us. So we can even deflect a loving thing into somebody else because we think they're more deserving than us. And then we try to stay with that person to attach ourselves to them, but not really own that we are entitled to the love. So there are all different ways that projective identification can operate. It's not always something aversive that's put in, but often we speak of it in clinical terms as the aversive part of the person that's literally deflected into us so that the therapist can then experience what the person really continually wants to disown. That's a very real traumatic reaction that keeps being triggered in them. And if the therapist can contain it, not be just reactive to it and get retaliatory or somehow shove it back into the patient or interpret it prematurely that they're doing this. If they can contain it, process it, think about it, then what, interestingly what happened with this person, even though she wanted so much to get away from me in that session and was saying she wished she had a break, when I was able to contain it, process it, and not impose it back on her, the next session she came in, she seemed much more committed to the therapy and wanting to set up new schedules with me.